Hi, I'm David Ray, a numismatist and collector of ancient coins and artifacts, particularly those related to the transition in the West from a predominantly pagan society to a predominantly Christian society. Five years ago, I published a book called The Secret Roots of Christianity, which used images, mostly from ancient coins, to track political, religious, and social changes in the West before, during, and after the lifetime of Jesus of Nazareth. Focusing on coin symbols also helped reveal the importance of astrology in the West during the same period. An appreciation of the role that astrology played in the development of Christianity is profoundly revealing about true Christian origins. An astrological understanding of the sign of Jonah is the keystone for decoding early Christian iconography. The following is new, it's true, and it affects everything you think you know about early Christianity. However, there is much to talk about and this presentation serves merely as an introduction. This picture of a zodiac in a New Age church in New York expresses a view of astrology that we associate with popular interest in the coming Age of Aquarius. Most modern Christians think that Jews and the earliest Christians 2,000 years ago had nothing to do with astrology, but nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible contains numerous references to signs, blood moons, and astrological communications from God to humanity. It's true that Christianity at different times throughout history has had an on-again, off-again relationship with astrology, but a religion whose Savior's birth was announced by a star can never distance itself completely. Zodiacs have served as important church decorations for centuries. It's surprising only that the relationship of the early church to astrology has attracted so little serious attention, and that mostly since the discovery of ancient Gnostic scriptures during the 20th century. Now, the biggest problem with considering the role of astrology in early Christianity is modern ignorance about naked eye astronomy. The increased reliance on electrical lighting and the general loss of visibility of the night sky due to light pollution has changed our lives so that few people ever see a dark starry sky. One of the especially nice features of this zodiac is the inclusion of asterisms associated with zodiacal constellations. It's as if the artist who designed it wanted to inspire people to find a dark sky and recognize the relationship between asterisms and images. Few people today know how planets and constellations look in the sky, how changes in the night sky reflect seasonal changes, and how naked eye astronomy can inspire wonder in the subtle beauty of the universe. Consider this orientation of the Chapel of Sacred Mirrors zodiac reflects the same great cross that Judean Jews would have perceived during the life of Jesus. From the point on the ecliptic where the vernal equinox sun passed from Pisces to Aries, a vertical line can be drawn to the point between Virgo and Libra where the sun announced the beginning of fall at the autumnal equinox. Similarly, from a point where the summer solstice sun passed from Gemini to Cancer, a horizontal line can be drawn to the point between Sagittarius and Capricorn, where the sun announced the beginning of winter at the winter solstice. In ancient times, Jews knew the sky because they slept on rooftops during the good weather much of the year. This nurtured an intimate familiarity with the night sky. They knew the important asterisms of Aries and Pisces. Notice that Pisces looks like an upside-down string holding two fish. In a real sky, the string lies horizontal with the long branch beneath the short one. In ancient Judea, simple calendars tracked the rising and setting zodiacal constellations, giving people the ability to tell time merely by glancing at the night sky. The motions of the sky during a night or a season 
interconnected and made sense, and the constantly changing positions of sun, moon, and planets communicated the thoughts of God. The century before the birth of Jesus brought new understanding about changes in the night sky. Astronomers discovered that the position of the sun during the vernal equinox changed very slowly over time through a process called precession. Western philosophers understood that the vernal equinox stood at the beginning of Taurus when the world was first created. Then the vernal equinox moved to Aries, signaling the beginning of the age of Aries, and a great flood occurred, the flood of Deucalion to pagans and the time of Noah's Ark to Jews. By the time that Jesus was born, everyone expected that the imminent age of Pisces would bring new possibilities and a new relationship with God, perhaps presaged by disaster. Astrologers taught that two heavenly gates served as openings between our universe of earth, stars, and planets and the higher realms of God. The gate in the constellation Capricorn had allowed heavenly waters to flood the world during the time of Noah, and the gate in Cancer similarly opened to fire whenever God might decide to cleanse a failed incarnation of humanity from the earth. Because of the Dark Ages and the speedy rise of technology in the modern era, we have preserved popular astrology in exactly the same form as it was conceived in the time of Jesus. We have ignored that the vernal equinox sun now rises close to the intersection of Pisces and Aquarius. In modern times, people identify themselves as having been born with the sun in one sign when they are far more likely to have been born while the sun occupied its neighbor. Here's another peculiar astrological belief from ancient times. The most advanced astrological theology from the time of Jesus maintained that divine human spirit fell from the sky to earth. Philosophers said that spirit entered our universe through the gate in Cancer and then fell through the five constellations, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius. During the century preceding the birth of Jesus, Jews in Egypt began teaching that this universe was a prison for human spirit which was condemned to live, die, and be reborn until it learned enough to liberate itself. Mystics began speaking about a path of spiritual liberation by ascent through seven constellations, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and then finally passing through the gate in Cancer. Zodiacs on Roman coins help show the importance of astrology and astrological magic precisely during the period when Christianity and paganism competed most fiercely. Roman emperors put zodiacs on coins for more than a century, beginning with the renewal of the New Sothic Cycle, a long Egyptian period that corresponded with an age. In the middle of the second century during the reign of Antoninus Pius. What makes these coins especially interesting is that they all used Roman astrological conventions to emphasize the importance of a specific date during the year. Romans considered the most important time of the day to be sunrise. Further, Romans oriented themselves by facing east. When people looked at these coins, they understood that the zodiacal position at 12 o'clock on the coin represented the position of the rising sun. Thus, if you can determine the, the sequence of constellations on a zodiac coin, you can determine the date considered important by the celator. This opportunistic survey of zodiac coins in the CNG database shows that Roman zodiac coins generally fell into two groups. Coins that indicated the vernal equinox, that is the Pisces-Aries boundary, as the most important date, and coins that indicated the Aries-Taurus boundary, approximately April 21st, as the most important date. A few outlier coins indicated other dates in fall, summer, and early spring. 
A detailed look at these coins in relation to emperors' lives would make an interesting presentation. Justification for the coins that point to the vernal equinox is easy to see. Important celebrations related to numerous pagan deities occurred at the vernal equinox. However, the importance of the Aries-Taurus boundary seems more cosmic in nature. It appears that emphasis of this date relates to its importance as a foundational event for the current species of humanity. In the middle, a first century lunar calendar from the Baths of Titus, dated 79 to 81 AD, also portrays a cosmic zodiac emphasizing the importance of the Aries Taurus boundary at sunrise. This calendar tracks the 30 days of the lunar month on the sides and also specifies the astrological ruler for each day. Probably originating in Egypt, the system of planetary rulership of days relied on an understanding that a different planet ruled every hour of every 24-hour day. Planetary rulers cycled through the 24 hours in the classic Chaldean sequence of planets based on their apparent speed of motion from slowest to fastest. Saturn, then Jupiter, Mars, Sun, Venus, Mercury, and Moon. The planetary ruler of the most important hour of a day gave its name to that day. For Romans, if the Sun ruled the first hour of a day, its name was Sunday. And 24 hours later, the Moon would rule the first hour of the next day, giving our standard order of the astrological week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Corresponding with the rulers, Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. This method of identifying a cycle of seven astrological days of the week proved so powerful and important for civilizations researching astrology and magic that the week spread quickly as far west as Britain and Scandinavia and as far east as Japan. However, even though everyone agreed about which planet ruled which hour of every day, different cultures disagreed on which hour of the day was the most important. The earliest date ever identified with its astrological day of the week was found in a graffito in Pompeii. It identified February 6, 60 A.D. as a Sunday. According to our modern calendar, however, the day was a Wednesday. This does not mean that the cycle of seven days changed between then and now. It means only that the person who inscribed the graffito identified the ruler of the day as the ruler of the first hour of evening twilight the previous day the time that modern Jews still use as the beginning of their day. In all likelihood, the person who inscribed the graffito in Pompeii was an Egyptian Jew. The roots of Egyptian Hermeticism, which contributed to astrology, extend back to descriptions of the afterlife in The Book of Two Ways, which originated among the priests of Thoth, uh, that's the Egyptian god of wisdom, in Hermopolis in the 12th dynasty, 1938 to 1759 BC, around the same time that Abraham lived according to Jewish tradition. The early connection of Judaism to Egyptian beliefs is apparent in the Egyptian name Moses, supposedly the author of the Bible's first five books, the Torah. From the time of the first temple, the book of Proverbs confirms that wisdom, Sophia, was with God at the very beginning, before water and land, when he first set the heavens in place and marked out the horizon on the face of the deep. From Hellenistic times, Baruch speaks of wisdom, Sophia, as a female presence whom God gave to his servant Israel to appear on earth and live among the Jewish people. Archaeology confirms that Jews established a community in Egypt on Elephantine Island in the 7th century BC. These Jews left traces in their writings 
of the beginnings of a Jewish hermeticism called Merkava mysticism. Merkava is the Hebrew word for chariot. After the destruction of the first temple in the 6th century BC, the prophet Jeremiah avoided slavery by coming to Egypt. Then it wasn't long until the image of God as a solar deity riding a divine chariot entered biblical tradition in the words of the prophet Ezekiel. In the century before Alexander the Great arrived in Egypt, the Jewish temple on Elephantine Island was destroyed, but a Jewish presence continued in Egypt. The Hellenistic rulers of Egypt promoted the confluence of Egyptian, Greek, Babylonian, and Jewish thought by scholars at the Library of Alexandria. Scholars translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, producing the Septuagint, and a new Jewish temple was built on the Nile Delta in the city Leontopolis. Judean Jews referred to the Jewish community in Egypt as the Land of Onias, after a Jewish priest who abandoned the Jerusalem temple as a corrupt and false institution. The greatest scholars of the Hellenistic age came to Egypt and spent time at the Library of Alexandria. They improved the application of trigonometry to astronomical research, estimating the circumference of the Earth and the distances from the Earth to the Sun and the Moon. They developed new philosophies and preserved important works containing the ideas of earlier philosophers. As one of the most enduring and influential creations, they developed most of what we know as modern astrology. With the discovery of precession by Hipparchus toward the end of the second century BC, the possibilities of learning the thoughts of God by measuring the motions of planets and stars across millennia seemed within the reach of a suitably brilliant scholar. The discovery of precession confirmed ideas about the Earth having gone through different historical ages. For Jews, the appearance of a nova and the timing of the upcoming transition to the age of Pisces seemed consistent with the Seventy Weeks Prophecy in the Book of Daniel, a work promoting the ideas of the Hasmonean rulers of Judea. From the beginning of Hasmonean independence, their most common coins displayed a star, consistent with both Messianic expectations and Hasmonean family pretensions. Hasmoneans also used the anchor as a solar symbol and a symbol of royalty. Jews acquired the anchor symbol from the Seleucids. Originally, the sun god Apollo had marked the mother of Seleucos I with an anchor symbol when he impregnated her with the spirit of the founder of the Seleucid Empire. During the century before the birth of Jesus, New Age religious ideas emerged from Egypt and influenced Jews who found fault with the increasing influence of foreigners and corruption in, in the Jerusalem temple. You can see this influence in critical Essene documents found at Qumran, in the contentious relationship between Samaritans and the Jerusalem temple, and in the teachings of John the Baptist preserved among Mandeans, who even today still identify him as the Messiah. In particular, some Essene documents indicated an otherwise hidden Jewish belief that the universe was created at the beginning of the age of Taurus. Eventually, hermetic ideas like these helped create Jewish and Christian types of Gnosticism. Until relatively modern times, ancient traditions preserved the name Hermes Trismegistes as the Egyptian founder of Hermeticism. He and Abraham were thought to be contemporaries and friends, both obtaining knowledge about occult secrets of the universe directly from God. In fact, when Lorenzo Medici, known as the Magnificent, was on his deathbed, he acquired copies of numerous lost classical works by authors like Plato and Aristotle that had been preserved and rediscovered in Arabic. He ordered that a copy of the Hermetica by Hermes Trismegistes be translated immediately before all other works. With the invention of the printing press, the Hermetica became one of the most popular books in Europe. Toward the end of the 15th century, the Borgia Pope Alexander VI 
endorsed the Hermetica, Kabbalah, and Astral Magic as subjects worthy of study by church leaders and all good men. He also issued a papal bull that legalized the study of magic for most of the 16th century. This helped jumpstart the development of science, but it also set up the resumption of terrible persecutions of witches toward the end of the 16th century, which continued in earnest through the 17th century. Ancient Egyptians had a sophisticated understanding of the realm of the dead different from that of any other culture. They believed that the dead spirits lived in the duat, the part of the sky hidden by the bright light of the sun. From April to May, the constellation Orion, known as the god Osiris by the Egyptians, traveled steadily west and disappeared into the illuminated sunset sky, soon to be followed by the bright star Sothis, the brightest star in Canis Major, identified as the goddess Isis, his consort. Egyptians understood that Osiris and Isis would travel for seventy days in the realm of the dead while the sun traveled the seventy-degree length of the duat. Then they finally emerged into the brightening sky of sunrise. Osiris emerged first, then the first appearance of Sothis, its so-called heliacal rising, occurred around July 20th as the sun was just leaving Cancer. The first appearance of Sothis marked the beginning of the annual Nile flood. Babylonians also considered this part of the sky as special. In their portrayal of this region of sky above, they called Orion the true shepherd of Anu, an appellation that scholars believe referred to Marduk, the ruler of all the gods in the universe. In Syria, the dying and resurrecting god Marduk evolved eventually into the dying and resurrecting god Baal. Note that Babylonians represented the summer solstice position of the sun on the ecliptic as a column with a bird on top, a symbol that Romans also came to use. It represented one of the pillars that held up the firmament, a sort of glass bowl that supported the stars while holding back the heavenly waters from flooding the earth. Just before the Hellenistic Age, Plato's student, Eudoxus of Canidos created an influential division of the sky into 48 constellations. In doing so, he encoded numerous teachings in the constellations from Greek, Egyptian, and Eastern cultures that his teacher thought important. For example, Plato's dialogue, Phaedrus, told the allegory of the fall of ignorant divine spirit driving a chariot pulled by twin horses divine reason and base emotion. Unable to control the horses, spirit crashed to earth. Greeks recognized this allegory as parallel to the story of Phaeton, a child of Helios who attempted to drive the chariot of his father across the sky, but who lost control of the horses, crashed and died. Gnostics and Hermeticists saw this portion of the sky as a graphic representation of the story about divine human spirit falling through the gate of cancer and crashing into physical incarnation on earth. Passing through the gate, spirit looked toward earth, saw its reflection, and fell in love. Suddenly, as a double being, Gemini, part mortal and part immortal, it took the nature of a charioteer, or Riga, trying to drive its mortal part and immortal part through the sky. Losing control, the composite being fell into incarnation at the beginning of the age of Taurus as a solar being, Orion, that crashed to earth. The crash ripped up a path that became the river and wetland, Eridanus, inhabited by creatures like the rabbit, Lepus. In this wetland, Heracles slipped, accidentally stepping on a crab while fighting the terrible Hydra, Echidna, a woman-headed snake who was the wife of snake-legged Typhon. After falling to earth, divine spirit became subject to Yahweh, the builder and ruler of this universe. 
Yahweh imprisoned spirit in soul and soul in bodies in a continuing cycle of death and rebirth. Divine spirit could free itself only by acquiring sufficient wisdom, or gnosis, to disengage from body and soul, making it possible to pass again through the gate in cancer and return to merge with its unnamed creator. The Greeks originally saw Auriga as a charioteer. However, after the emergence of Christianity, Riga often was portrayed as a shepherd. This may have resulted from associations of this part of the sky with the shepherd of Anu, which connects with the Gnostic understanding of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. Jesus was a special incarnation that fell to earth, specifically to clear a return path for other instances of divine spirit to return to God. Note that the shepherd in this picture of the constellation Auriga carries a Capricorn on his back. For Gnostic Christians, Capricorn, as the first constellation after the winter solstice, represented the first constellation of the ascent, the return path toward union with God. In modern times, people have forgotten the symbols used by the earliest Christians. Also, people read the Bible without understanding its astronomical references. For example, the Hebrew Bible refers to God as the Lord of hosts 261 times. This refers to God as the leader of a vast army. God's army comprises the stars and planets as angels in the sky. In the Gospel of Luke, a heavenly host praises God at the birth of Jesus. In ancient times, everyone understood that heavenly host referred to a gathering of planets. To Gnostic Christians, two versions of God existed. The manifest version called Yahweh, responsible for running the seasons and clockwork of the sky, and the invisible nameless version that created everything that existed and lived inside every human being as a spark longing to return to the Creator. Christians commonly portrayed Yahweh Sabaoth, or Yahweh Lord of Hosts, as a snake-legged armored rooster holding a shield and whip. This helps explain why Romans thought of Yahweh as a son or nephew of snake-legged Typhon. Corresponding with the female spirit of wisdom, Sophia, an erotic goddess named Aurora Phrasis, taking forms reminiscent of Venus, Isis, and Artemis as the Queen of Heaven, sought to distract spiritual seekers from the path toward Gnosis. The pendant with images labeled Yao Sabaot and Aurora Phrasis was an attempt to distract the attention of these deities from its wearer, providing him with just a little more freedom to follow the path of ascent through Gnosis. To see where Gnostic Christians saw Yahweh in the sky, compare the asterism of the constellation Orion with the image of Yao Sabaoth on the pendant. You easily can see the asterism representing the shield, the whip, and the snake legs. Modern Christianity has distanced itself from astrology. Also, modern Christians believe that the sign of Jonah refers only to the death and resurrection of Jesus. However, in the Gospels, when Jesus spoke of the sign of Jonah, nobody asked questions. Everyone understood signs as configurations of lights in the sky. The miracles performed by Jesus on earth had nothing to do with signs. That's why Jesus said that no sign would be given to the current generation except for the sign of Jonah. Nobody asked him what that meant because, in their experience, the sign of Jonah already had occurred. Connections between Jesus and the Good Shepherd emerged most directly from hermetic and pagan associations of Jesus with the god Hermes Creophoros and the god Attis. In modern times, we largely have forgotten both these deities but the most common early Christian images of Jesus portrayed him looking like Hermes Creophoros. 
In addition, our celebrations of Christmas and Easter strongly resemble ancient religious celebrations of Attis and his consort, Kibili, a goddess known in ancient times as the Queen of Heaven. The image on the top left portrays Attis lying under a tree just after he attempted to commit suicide by castrating himself. Consistent with his appellation, Good Shepherd, he lies surrounded by sheep. In the Gospel of John, when Jesus described himself as the Good Shepherd, Pharisaic Jews say that he has gone mad, not because Jesus has declared his mission metaphorically as taking care of his followers, but because he identified himself as an incarnation of Attis. The image on the top right portrays Attis having acquired immortality, riding with Kabili and her cart, pulled by a team of lions. In the Levant, Attis was conflated with the deity Adonis, whose name comes from the word for Lord, like the Phoenician word Baal, a descendant of the god Marduk, and the Hebrew word Adonai, still frequently heard in synagogues as an appellation of God. The most familiar surviving images of Jesus as the Good Shepherd match ancient images of Hermes Creophoros, a deity associated with ancient Greek Hermeticism. The first century AD coin in the lower right from the Greek island of Boeotia portrays a bust of Poinmandres, the founder of Tanagra, on the obverse, and an image of Hermes Creophoros on the reverse. The surviving Corpus Hermetica includes a dialogue attributed to Poinmandres. Note that even though Lorenzo the Magnificent believed that the Hermetica dated from the time of Abraham and Hermes Trismegistes, the original Greek text now is thought to date from the 2nd century AD. Regarding his modern translation of the theological and philosophical works of Hermes Trismegistes, John David Chambers said, Of all Hermetic texts surviving from Alexandria, Poinmandres is the prime source of Gnostic speculation. The speaker in the Socratic dialogue, Poinmandres, proposes a severely dualistic view of life, in which the body represents everything dark, deceptive, temporal, and mortal, while the mind, nos, portrays truth, timelessness, and eternal salvation. The purpose of life is to free the soul from the prison of the body through gnosis and to return to the heavenly realm of light. So one leaves the physical universe by embarking on a celestial journey through seven levels of spirituality until one comes to the Father of all. Then he enters the eighth sphere of the fixed stars and becomes God. It is notable that for Hermeticists, God, despite the title Father of all, is androgynous and contains both sexes. In the revelation of Asclepios, God is defined as bisexual. Poinmandres has three sections. The first section, which tells of the creation of the world and human life, is a hermetic cosmogony and anthropogeny revealed to the speaker as a visionary experience. Part two recounts the soul's escape from the world and its ascent to heaven and mystical union with God. The final part contains instructions for proselytizing the gospel of Gnosis. The work ends with a prayer. Hermeticism blended well with Hellenistic astrology. The most vivid astrological connection between Jesus and Christian iconography of the Good Shepherd lies in the position of the sun during the crucifixion on April 7, 30 A.D. In modern times, we think that people in ancient times were too unsophisticated to understand the position of the sun in the daylight sky. After all, we need an app to do it. However, as early as the 7th century B.C., Jewish calendars built in the ability to track the motions of the sun through the zodiac, at least into thirds of a constellation. The crucifixion of Jesus occurred while the sun occupied the central third of the constellation Aries. Early Christians thought of Jesus as a solar being who fell to earth and incarnated as a man, 
so they portrayed him as the sun god Apollo. Adding a sheep around the sun god's neck referred specifically to the crucifixion. Modern eyes need a computer-generated model of the sky surrounding the sun at the moment of crucifixion to see what ancient people commonly understood. See the god? See the sheep? Note in this picture that Orion, commonly understood as Yahweh Sabaoth by early Christians, stands not far to the left of the sun. Andromeda, understood in the Levant as the constellation representing the Queen of Heaven, stands not far to the right. Below the sun, the monster Ketos, the same monster that swallowed Jonah, opens its mouth to attack the belly of Ares the ram and swallow the sun. Directly above the sun to the right of Taurus lies the constellation Perseus, associated by worshippers of the cult of Mithras with the hidden prime mover, Sol Invictus, the god who made life possible through the shedding of immortal blood at the beginning of the age of Taurus. However, many people in the Levant associated the constellation Perseus with the old god simply known as El. In various ways, people from different traditions could consider this moment and this part of the sky and see a gathering of divinities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, reflected in the constellations. Scholars often speak of the earliest Christian iconography as a disjoint jumble of images, reflecting the confusion of Christians as they struggled to invent appropriate religious symbols. About images on early Christian sarcophagi in particular, scholars compare them to musical staccato, resembling separate, sharp, distinct notes in a musical composition. The Christian sarcophagus in this image contains good shepherd images on the left and right corners representing the crucifixion of Jesus. In between, a sequence of images portrays the story of Jonah. To the right, of the first good shepherd, Jonah has attempted to escape his duty to preach to the people of Nineveh against their wickedness. He boarded a ship sailing west toward Spain. But God stopped him by sending a storm, represented by two personifications of winds above the ship. Recognizing Jonah as the cause of the storm, one sailor grabbed Jonah and threw him overboard to be devoured by the monster Ketos a serpent-bodied dinosaur. Ketos carried Jonah from the Mediterranean Sea, apparently around Africa because the Suez Canal didn't exist yet, then up the Tigris River to Nineveh, modern Mosul. There, Ketos regurgitated Jonah on the beach three days after swallowing him, still alive. Above the regurgitation scene, Jonah lies on his back beneath a hanging gourd vine, contemplating his duty to preach to the inhabitants of Nineveh. Modern Christians think that the importance of the story of Jonah lies mostly in its use as a metaphor for the death and resurrection of Jesus. However, I suggest that the original connection of the story with Jesus comes more directly from astrology. Compare the standard image of Jonah lying under the gourd vine with the structure of the constellations Pisces and Pegasus. The lower arm of the constellation Pisces follows an arc reminiscent of the contour of land leading to the recumbent Jonah. The upper arm of Pisces leads to the top part of Pegasus, following the path of the gourd vine over Jonah. There is a structural resemblance, but there seems little point to it in the context of our modern understanding of these constellations in the sky. These four images from the story of Jonah were produced at different times and different places, but they all look as if the artist who made them had a specific model in mind. The obvious explanation that one artistic master made an image that everyone else copied seems unsupportable. Christianity started as a grassroots movement generally without master artisans and without funding to produce artistic masterpieces. It seems far more likely that early Christian artists who wanted to make a picture of the story of Jonah 
needed only to look in the sky to find a suitable and consistent model for their artistic vision. Let's look at the constellations around Pisces more closely. The ancient Levantine understanding of these constellations was vastly different from our understanding. In modern times, we think of Pisces as a stringer cord holding two caught fish. In the ancient Levant, however, Pisces told the story of the birth of the goddess Artemis, the queen of heaven. Instead of a stringer, the two branches of Pisces represented the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. A fish in the top, Euphrates branch, found a divine egg and pushed it up the lower Tigris branch toward the city of Nineveh. Pushing it to shore, the fish passed the egg to a dove who protected it until it hatched whereupon Artemis emerged from it fully grown. Thus, fish and doves were considered sacred in the cult of Artemis, similar to the special place they held in early Christian iconography. In the Levantine understanding of the constellation Pisces, the upper branch ended in the shape of a fish, and the lower branch ended in the shape of a bird. Just above the bird, Levantine saw a cultivated field instead of the winged horse Pegasus. Above the field, they saw the goddess Artemis in the constellation Andromeda, represented in the constellation chart as a stag, another animal considered sacred to Artemis. The parallels between the Jonah iconography and the Levantine understanding of Pisces seem compelling, especially when one considers that the name Jonah comes from the Hebrew word for dove. In ancient times, people divided each of the twelve zodiacal constellations into three parts and assigned a relationship with another constellation to each part. This explains why people easily adopted the innovation of identifying precisely 48 constellations in the sky. After assigning 12 30-degree regions along the ecliptic to the zodiacal constellations, 36 constellations remained that could be assigned one at a time to each 10-degree region called a decan along the ecliptic. Even though different city-states and regions disagreed about which 48 constellations existed, they all agreed that the total number of constellations was exactly 48. Unfortunately, however, no documents specifying the assignment of constellations to decans along the ecliptic has survived. In the early 19th century, a linguist, historian, anti-slavery activist, and all-around scholar named Francis Rolleston realized that early Christians had assigned constellations to decans along the ecliptic in a way that encoded information about Jesus. She set about recovering the assignments. She worked on the task for 50 years before publishing her results in a book called Maserot, the Hebrew word for constellations. These days, scholars rarely mention her work except to criticize it. They say that she was categorically wrong and state that any attempt to recreate the ancient assignments would be like looking for pictures in clouds. Regardless, no one else has offered a better set of assignments than hers, which deserves to be used at least as a well-considered hypothesis. Francis Rolleston assigned the constellations Perseus, that's the old god El, Ketos, the swallower of Jonah, and Cassiopeia, the evil queen in the story about Perseus, to decans of the constellation Ares, and the constellations Andromeda, that's the queen of heaven, Cepheus, a seated king in the Perseus story, and the cord, that's the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, to decans of the constellation Pisces. In short, Ares and Pisces go together like Perseus and Andromeda. The two parts of the story of Jonah, being swallowed by Ketos during a sea voyage and then regurgitated on the banks of the Tigris River near Nineveh, connect easily to constellations around Ares and Pisces. On the sarcophagus on the lower right 
One even can find specific references. For example, the three sheep on the gourd vine represent the three decans of Aries. Jonah and Ketos both look directly at the middle decan, where the sun stood during the crucifixion, as if it's especially important. Then two images to the right of Jonah, Sophia in the Aran's position and the seated man, referred to two decans of Pisces, Andromeda and Cepheus. For good measure, the good shepherd refers specifically to the crucifixion. One might then ask, why does the good shepherd appear separate from the other astrological references to Aries? The answer lies in the realization that Christians presented Aries and Pisces symbolically together to represent the sign that occurred at the birth of Jesus. The Good Shepherd, on the other hand, specifically represented the crucifixion. The astrological sign that announced the birth of Jesus had been expected for generations. When people saw it, Jews in particular understood that it indicated the beginning of a new spiritual age. The only problem was that different teachers interpreted the sign in different ways. This resulted in confusion. The development of numerous radical movements and counterproductive infighting among Jews. Nevertheless, it also furthered the development and rapid growth of Christianity. Rediscovering the connection between astrology and early Christian iconography provides insight into the differences between early Christianity and modern Christianity. This connection helps explain why so many non-Jews found it easy to transfer their pagan belief systems to the worship of Jesus, why early Christians identified Jesus as a solar deity and associated Mary Magdalene with the goddess Artemis, as shown in the ancient crypto-gospel Joseph and Asenath, why the cult of Mary as Queen of Heaven emerged easily and quickly in the early church, and why worshippers of Attis and Mithras found it particularly easy to embrace early Christianity. While writing The Secret Roots of Christianity, I chose the work of Michael Molnar as the most historically accurate explanation of the Star of Bethlehem. He connected the term to an important astrological sign discussed in the early 4th century in writings by the Christian astrologer Julius Firmicus Maternus. Michael Molnar documented numerous historical reasons for believing that the astronomical event behind the astrological sign inspired nativity stories that appear only in Matthew and Luke, representing the star of Bethlehem as a divine announcement of the birth of Jesus. Jews referred to it as the sign of Jonah, a term also mentioned only in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. This is how astrology and the sign of Jonah first began to guide the development of early Christian iconography. In his book, Mathesis, Julius Firmicus Maternus clearly identified the principal astrological characteristic of a sign that indicated the physical incarnation of a divine being. It was the occultation, or covering, of Jupiter by the moon on the morning of the first emergence of Jupiter from the sun's glare, Jupiter's so-called heliacal rising. This astrological event is rare occurring generally once every couple of centuries. However, the sign alone was not enough to guarantee a divine incarnation. All the other planets had to be in favorable locations as well. Michael Molnar, a numismatist and professional astronomer, demonstrated that this extraordinarily rare sign occurred only once during the centuries around the birth of Jesus, and the date it occurred was April 17th, 6 B.C. Two years before the death of King Herod the Great, this date was the perfect moment for the story of the Magi's visit to Judea in search of the newborn king. In addition, the sign that occurred 
involved every known planet in a way so extraordinary that everyone who knew anything about astrological expectations of the beginning of a new age would have understood this sign as an important announcement from God. An astrology chart at the lower right makes the arrangement of planets and constellations easier to see and understand. All seven heavenly lights clustered together closely, four in Aries, two in Taurus, and one in Pisces. In fact, according to Matthew, special emphasis in the chart on Aries rising in the east, the sign of Judea, directed certain professional magi, astrologers, westward toward Judea as the most likely place of birth for the divinity. Venus and the Sun occupied Pisces and Aries respectively, signs that exalted them, an indication of a regal birth. Saturn and Jupiter also were exceptionally favored in Aries. Rising before the Sun, Saturn and Jupiter served as a textbook example of the Sun's regal spear-bearers. Rising after the Moon, Mars and Mercury, barely in Taurus, served as attendants of the Moon in Aries. All the planets were exceptionally well placed. In addition to extraordinarily beneficial indications, the special placement of Saturn and Venus spoke directly to expectations of the New Age. Saturn, the planet of endings, occupied the last part of Aries, signifying the end of the Age of Aries, and Venus, the bright morning star personification of Sophia occupied the beginning of its special sign, Pisces, signifying the beginning of the age of Pisces. The occultation of Jupiter by the moon took place at precisely the same location in the sky that the sun occupied almost 36 years later during the crucifixion of Jesus. Characteristics of the sign immediately connected the event with the story of Jonah. Just below Jupiter and the moon, the open maw of the constellation Ketos beneath the belly of Aries connected this event with the swallowing of Jonah. Characteristic of an occultation, the moon appeared to swallow Jupiter. The image portrays the moon advanced to its noontime position after it covered Jupiter. Then the moon disappeared from the sky, only to emerge three days later on the other side of the sun at sunset. It's not surprising that the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, the only canonical Gospels to speak about the birth of Jesus, use astrological language and mention the sign of Jonah, the ancient name of the Star of Bethlehem. Here's another interesting coincidence connecting the birth of Jesus to his death. Having learned that Jews and Romans use different astrological days of the week, we can see that Good Friday and Easter Sunday are Roman calendrical conventions. What were the original Jewish astrological days of the week for the crucifixion and resurrection? According to modern scholarship, the Romans crucified Jesus on Nisan 14, 30 AD, actually a Thursday on the Roman calendar. On this day, the moon had ruled the twilight hour the previous evening, so Jews with an interest in astrology understood that the moon ruled the day of the crucifixion. Three days later, a Sunday to Romans, Jews familiar with the sign of Jonah then heard that Jesus had risen on a day ruled by Jupiter. Immediately, they connected the crucifixion and resurrection with the astrological sign of divinity that had happened 36 years earlier involving the moon and Jupiter. Two tombs found in Talpiot, a neighborhood of Jerusalem, provide examples of the very earliest symbols of the sign of Jonah, underscoring its astrological character. The tombs were found on an ancient wealthy estate associated with Joseph of Arimathea. One tomb contained poorer material but all the names found in the tomb match names in the family of Jesus. The lowest symbol in the picture, looking like Jupiter swallowed by the moon, marked the entrance of this tomb. Inside the tomb, the top symbol, 
resembling the appearance of the moon and Jupiter in the morning sky on April 17th, 6 BC, was carved on the lid of the ossuary of Jesus, son of Joseph. The symbol just above Jupiter and the moon was carved on a splendid ossuary from the wealthy tomb, probably belonging to the master of the estate. Similar in shape to the crudely drawn symbol on the ossuary of Jesus, the symbol features scales, fins, and even the name Jonah in a crude representation of a fish swallowing a man. Consider this early Christian sarcophagus in the British Museum and the detailed information on its label. We easily recognize the story that begins with Jonah being tossed from the ship and swallowed. Then we see him deposited near Nineveh and lying beneath a gourd vine. The label informs us that the ram resting on the cloud above the ship provides a necessary pastoral element to the story of Jonah. However, now we understand that the sarcophagus metaphorically portrays Aries and Pisces, the two most important zodiacal constellations related to Jesus and the sign of Jonah. To early Christians, Aries and Pisces went together like Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Now we understand that the previous sarcophagus that framed the story of Jonah with images of the Good Shepherd referred directly to the birth and death of Jesus. But this sarcophagus does something different. At either end of the sarcophagus, we have two views of gourd vines, both symbolic of the age of Pisces, with additional symbols. On the left, Quito swims beneath the vine in a region of endless flood, symbolizing Capricorn. On the right, a peacock, more likely a phoenix, eats the fruit of the gourd vine. The phoenix represents the gate in cancer opening to eternal life. This sarcophagus metaphorically represents the ascent as the special opportunity of the age of Pisces made possible by the divine incarnation of Jesus. Now consider a more complicated example of early Christian iconography on the Santa Maria Antiqua sarcophagus. It's intimidating at first glance. The Neptune on the left side calls to mind statements from scholars about the confusion of early Christians just emerging from paganism. Almost in apology, we are informed that the trident held by Neptune can be considered a Christian symbol of the Trinity. However, realizing that Neptune represented Aquarius, the constellation symbolizing water pouring from the sky, the possibility emerges that the sarcophagus presents a clear astrological message. But where's Capricorn, the first constellation of the ascent? Tradition says that Jesus was baptized by John during the month of January. The heavens opened as they had during the time of Noah, and a flood of Holy Spirit descended on the earth. The figures to the right of the Good Shepherd, the Boy, the Dove, and John the Baptist, represent Capricorn. The Good Shepherd represents the crucifixion with the sun in Aries, but three sheep perched in the gourd vine also represent the three decans of Aries. Perhaps the Christian artist who carved the sarcophagus intended the Good Shepherd to represent Orion, a decan of Taurus. Ketos and Jonah stare directly at the center decan where the sign of Jonah occurred and where the sun stood during the crucifixion. By far, however, the pride of place is given to the decans of Pisces, the cord, Andromeda, and Cepheus. Jonah lies under the gourd vine, the cord. Next to that, Sophia, Andromeda, stands in the Iran's position, and the dead person, portrayed as the seated King Cepheus reading a codex, sits between Sophia and the Good Shepherd. What about Taurus? God gave the Torah to Moses during the month of May. Shavuot celebrates this event as well as the kingship of David. Thus, the Codex, at a minimum, represents the constellation Taurus. On the right of the sarcophagus, two fishermen unabashedly represent Gemini. Lest there be any confusion about apostles as fishers of men, 
two stars decorate the net between the twins. So where's Cancer? Take a look at the ship to the left of Jonah, the sheep and the gourd vine. Usually, a ship representing the sign of Jonah in Aries features sailors tossing Jonah to Ketos, prepared to swallow. But Aries already is well represented. Instead of a ship in a storm, this ship sails in a calm sea with a triumphant, heroic sailor. Argo, a decan of Cancer and the ship of heroes, represents completion of the ascent and passage to a different spiritual realm. This offers new meaning to the ship that one sometimes sees as a lone symbol of early Christianity. I offer and recommend this spreadsheet as a tool for investigating early Christian iconography. Having spent time already analyzing many sarcophagi, I can distinguish three broad variations of early Christianity. The first type, of which the Santa Maria Antiqua sarcophagus is exemplary, continues an iconographic tradition that began in the first century AD among the first Jewish Christians. The second type used astrological symbols in a more hidden way than the first and also applied special attention to Peter. The third type abandoned astrological symbolism and venerated Peter and Paul equally. This last type appears to have dominated Christian iconography after the 7th century AD. There is much to discuss, but this presentation will go no further. The analysis of categories of Christianity and their histories based purely on iconography is best left to future lectures. Nevertheless, here are several takeaways from this presentation for future consideration. Earliest Christianity included a strong astrological component and was distinctly more Gnostic than most people think. One can distinguish different variations of early Christianity based purely on iconography. And finally, a spreadsheet listing ascent constellations, Rolleston decans, sign of Jonah details, crucifixion solar position, ancient constellation meanings, and religious festivals by month can serve as a valuable tool for using iconography to distinguish populations and competing variations of early Christianity. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and found the role of astrology in early Christianity interesting. Further, I hope this way of looking at ancient Christian artifacts opens a new window into ancient lives and movements. Now, looking at an artifact like this 5th century Roman lamp from Britain, one can see more clearly into the history and hopes of people who used it. In addition, we all have a new opportunity for seeing exactly what people saw in ancient times. We need only to find a secluded place on a dark, clear night and gaze at the constellations Ketos, Aries, Pisces, and Pegasus to see the structural model that inspired the artists. Thank you for your attention. Please let me know if you have any questions.